in the Central California ESU. Uh, there's other watersheds that might have more in that ESU, but ours is the one that doesn't have a hatchery. So we're proud of the fact that we've been able to maintain this wild stock coho. Um, then we have the Shark Stewards, which is another project that just actually joined us. Shark Stewards is still Sea Stewards with David McGuire, and David's now on our team. And he's got a desk next to mine, and he's taken sea stewards and turned it into shark stewards. And he was really instrumental in authoring and passing the ban on shark fins in California. That was a law last year, AB 376. So um, there was a rider attached to that. It really won't be illegal for the for stores to possess shark fins until 2013. But in the meantime, we know that it's illegal for them to have them in commerce new shark fins should be passing into California. And you know, the, the effort is really gaining a lot of momentum and the shark stewards um, have introduced a similar law to AB 376 in Texas, Illinois, Indiana, and we're working on New York and a couple other states too. So trying to take this policy change, you know, state by state, uh, things in Washington DC are moving so smoothly. So uh, the last project is Got Mercury, and Got Mercury is a public education and also um, a science project. The volunteers that we get with the Got Mercury project go to restaurants and sushi restaurants and get samples of seafood and test it for mercury and put out a report and work with the media to share the news that there's still this issue of high mercury content in seafood, usually the highest level seafood like swordfish, um, tuna, etc. are the higher um, mercury concentrations and that could be a risk for um, women, especially children, and especially women having children. Um, biggest risk. So Turtle Island, our, our main headquarters office is up on Sir Francis Drake Boulevard in West Marin, and we're a park partner. We're on Golden Gate uh, GDNRA land, and you know we love being up there. It's really beautiful. It's an it's a ongoing restoration site, actually. We are working with Fish and Game to improve the habitat, bring down fences, you know, take out some of the invasive plants, put and do a lot of planting native plants with spawn and, and it's been really great so really pleased to be here with you guys today to talk about the sea turtles um, and here we go we got four main sea turtles that we're going to see in california and we'll just try to figure this out okay anybody have any guess as to which sea turtle this one is green. this this green. one is kind of tinted green and it's a green sea turtle absolutely so green sea turtles are actually down near San Diego. There's a population of about 100 of them that live there, and they're adults. And there's one that's like a 350 pounder. It's really big. The green sea turtle gets to be the second largest species of sea turtle in the world. There's seven species total. One of them, the Kemp's Ridley, lives only in the Gulf of Mexico in the eastern seaboard. The other, the flatback sea turtle, breeds only in Australia and is in the Indian Ocean and the South Pacific there. So those aren't in California. The green sea turtle as an adult is a vegetarian. So this is another sea turtle species that's got a big head. Which one's that? Anybody ever heard of that? Say it again. Loggerhead, yes. So we got the green, we got the loggerhead. Most loggerheads in the Pacific uh, are born in Japan. So we're kind of worried about that right now. There's a lot of, um, Japan you know, had a really uh, traumatic earthquake and tsunami. And it was mostly affecting the northern area and most of the sea turtle nesting is in the south. Okay, this is the one that we, we see um, a lot in Costa Rica with a huge nesting event called the Arribada. What sea turtle is that? That is the olive Ridley. Olive Ridley sea turtle is actually, all, all sea turtle species are endangered. Um, actually, the flatback, they say it's data deficient. I mean, we really don't know what the flatback is. There's not enough people down there sharing their research. There's people doing the research, but not a lot of it's shared, um, unfortunately. So with the olive ridley, if any sea turtle is going to come off the endangered list, it's probably going to be the olive ridley. Recent, in the last couple decades, beach protections with olive ridley have really increased its population. The survivorship of the, of the babies is up. The fact that they're being born and making it to the ocean is the key thing. Uh, there's some beaches in Costa Rica where this sea turtle population comes ashore in a four to five day cycle called an arribata in Spanish that means arrival. Um, anywhere between 100 and 400,000 sea turtles all at the same time nesting. It's just a crazy flurry. The, the, this is the one controversial thing we were talking, Scott and I were talking about, is the first couple days of the Arribada, it's actually legal, usually it's illegal, to harvest and, and take the sea turtle eggs. And then they sell them in bars and so on. The, in, in Costa Rica and a lot of Central America, they believe it's like a natural Viagra, manly thing. To 
e to c general a. And so the problem with that is then anywhere they poach the eggs and bring them to the bars, they can just say, look, I got them from Oski and all. I got them from this one beach. And we actually have a whole page that gets a ton of traffic on our website about the Costa Rica, Oski and all, Ari Lada situation. Because you see these photos circling around, the emails, and these people with these huge bags of sea turtle eggs. And, and it can be done, man it can be managed um, more or less sustainably. The government is involved in a lot of, a lot of conservation projects are down there monitoring the harvest. Um, it does happen, but it is controversial. So here's the one that we're talking about mostly today. Who knows what this one is? That's the leatherback. That's the leatherback. Okay, so it's the only sea turtle that doesn't have a hard shell carapace. It's the last remaining member of the um, family Germicillidae. And all the other sea turtle species are different. So the leatherback is really unique. We're going to talk more about that. So one of the things our program does um, as a nonprofit, you know, we have very limited resources. You know, I love to do science, I'm a scientist, and you know, it came to me like we need to just try to increase the awareness and try to get more observations reported of these leatherbacks off California. So we two years ago we started the Leatherback Watch program with our summer intern, and we basically just call up all the boats and, and uh, harbor masters and whale watching groups and you know ask the question, have you seen this sea turtle? And occasionally they do. And even better, now they're connected with us, they know what we need, they take the photo, they log the GPS coordinates. We get those three things, and Scott Benson down in Moss Landing, who's the National Marine Fisheries Service lead scientist on the Leatherback, he'll accept that as a valid sighting and put it in his database too. So we have our database of graded sightings, you know, like an A is, is when we have those three things, a B is like we didn't get a photo, but we have an experienced naturalist and the coordinates, and so on, you know, down to Someone saw it, but that person is just a tourist, and they didn't get a picture, and we don't know exactly where the coordinates were. You know, that would be a low-grade sighting, but we still report it. Last summer, we reported about 24 sightings. About eight of those had a photo, GPS, and, you know, an experienced naturalist handing it over. So, really pleased with that. And so, we share the data with, with NIMS again, and we educate, connect, and expand the awareness. So, this is one of my favorite photos. It was, it was taken last summer. Uh, actually, 2010. This one was taken last summer. And this is an interesting photo right there. You can see these colors on the back of the head. Those are believed to be unique so that when the sea turtle is nesting on the beach, you can take a photo of the back of its head. Or in this case, we got the photo. And the spot pattern is believed to be a unique identifier of individuals. So we're working on that, storing the, those photos. And hopefully in a couple years, we'll be able to say, look, it's the same one. So these are pretty amazing creatures, the leatherbacks. Um, and we're going to look at now um, what we have is like the Hallmark publication in 2011. So this is, a, this is borrowed from Scott Benson's paper in Ecosphere. And what it is is satellite track sea turtles, leatherbacks, that all nested here in these islands here. So this is where they're nesting. And when they, when they um, are out in the water, if you want to do research, it's tough. It's tough to grab this huge sea turtle, get it on a boat, and work with it. So, when they're nesting is when you have your chance. All sea turtles, when they're nesting, they go into a trance. I mean, they can be very easily disturbed on their way up, but once they get in the zone and they have their pit dug and their, the eggs are dropping, um, you know, if they see you, they're in the zone and they just keep going. And that can mean that the poachers have an easy time, but it also gives the scientists a window of opportunity as they finish laying the eggs and they're covering it up, the scientists can get in there and put the satellite tag. Actually, with the leatherback, you can't glue it to the shell. It's like a little backpack they wear, and it has these uh, um, metal magnesium rings on it that dissolve in the salt water at the same rate the battery runs out. So technically, the, the backpack will fall off when the battery runs out. So it's not something that's on the sea turtle forever. Um, and here we go. So look at these sea turtles. They're going across the entire Pacific Ocean. All right, so we've got a couple things labeled. You know, this is a Papua New Guinea, and there's uh, some other island, I forget, and this is the main one right here. This is the main nesting site here and there. Uh, Papa Barat, that's what it is in Indonesia right here. Um, so this island actually has a, a, a border right here of two different nations, and this side's Indonesia. And that was where most of the research was done, and they found that there's these main foraging areas. After they nest, they either go down here to eastern Australia, over here to the to this zone over off New Zealand. Um, this is the Kirochio Extension Current. It's like the Gulf Stream on the other side of the, of the Pacific.
Pacific, would, you know, in an analogous to the Atlantic Gulf Stream, comes on up, swoops in here, and creates a bit of a North Pacific gyre. Um, there's a bunch of them come in. Well, let's go Eastern Equatorial Pacific. They're hanging out, not so much. But look at all these dots. Look at all those dots just wow. hanging in there. Really dense, really dense. You know, this is the California current ecosystem. This is where we are, and this is what uh, really makes Leatherback the focus of our conservation area is it needs this healthy California current ecosystem. And, you know, as we look a little closer in a second here, we'll see the Bay Area is one of the hot spots. So, you know, really cool that we've been learning about their use in this area. The science, which really the first satellite track sea turtle across the Pacific was like in 1996, 1994, depending on which scientists uh, published. And, you know, so this is all relatively new information. So we see now that these green dots, okay, these are the sightings, you know, from the airplanes and the boats. And then the, the red dots are also sightings, but these are when their um, drift gill net takes, like when the observer, there's only observers on like 15% of the boats, um, sees that they've caught a leatherback sea turtle in the gill net. You know, that's where the red dots come from. And the black dots are the satellite tracks, you know, the actual, the individual data points so that you see this one in here. So we, we know that they're endangered. They've been on the endangered species list since 1970. I mean, the endangered species list was born with this animal on it. And the area that the animal needs is its habitat, right? And so if you have a species on the endangered species list, you want critical habitat designated for your animal because critical habitat will do more environmental review, another level of protection hurdles um, for your animal. And so we petitioned the, the Turtle Island Restoration Network with some allies to get critical habitat for leatherback sea turtles off of California. And what we petitioned for was this area here. And this is actually the same boundary as the current fisheries management zone known as the um, leatherback conservation area for the drift gill net fishery. And we knew enough information in like 1998 and, and 2000 to get that established in 2001. And the drift gill net fishery is closed in the summer months when the leatherbacks are most common in that area. There's still a ton of drift gillnet fishing taking place down here, and also some leatherback takes, as you can see from these red dots. So the National Marine Fishery Service came back to us in, in 2009 and said, see these octagons, see the blue octagons? You know, we divided up the area, we're going to give you those. That's our proposal. So that was 72,000 square miles of habitat. Pretty good. You know, they, in their proposal, said that, you know, the two things that we're going to look at are migration and prey. And, you know, they put on there those blue areas near the coast, but and they claimed that migration was one of the things they cared about, but they didn't put in the areas that were offshore of those <coughs> areas. So, you know, we submitted a bunch of comments, and uh, we'll, we'll get to that. But this is what we got. So February 27, the critical habitat became final. And it's happening, it's, it's, it's in gear right now. I mean, this is it. Here's the map. Um, it's the largest sea turtle protected area in the history of U.S. conservation. And a lot of it's in California. So 16,910 square miles are in California. There's 41,914 square miles total. A lot of that's offshore of Oregon and Washington. Of uh, area designated as critical habitat for the leatherback sea turtle off the West Coast. So this is really what I'm here to talk about. You know, we're really proud that we got this here. Thank you. Um, after like five or six years of work. And so we're going to talk about that. You know, how did we get here? What does it mean? Um, and what's new, what's, what's next, right? So here's my little zoom in, and, and uh, this is the California, you know, one with the little cartoon sea turtle. All right, so what happened? So we're back in 2007, and there's my timeline. Uh, basically, you can see we partnered with the Center for Biological Diversity, that we call the center, and uh, Oceana. And we did the Leatherback Conservation Area as the foundation for our petition, saying, look, this is already a management zone. It's big, we like that. Let's, let's go for it. And, and they found it right away, you know, positive finding that, that our petition was valid. And then the 12-month finding was published with a proposed rule in 2009. Anybody with some quick math skills is going to say, wait a minute, that's not 12 months between 07 and 2010. Uh, that was kind of foreboding in the delays that we experienced. And here's what the proposed rule said. The proposed rule said, we're going to focus on the principal biological or physical constituent elements within the area that are central to the conservation of the species. The primary constituent elements. If you get into critical habitat, this is what matters. Okay? 
in the proposed rule include migratory pathway conditions and the quality and quantity of prey. So the migratory is the state of the area through which the load of extroverts for feeding and reproduction. And then the, the prey. Okay, so they basically were like, and this is what we do. The leatherback need California because they swim here and eat jellyfish. That's what that says. Um, so here's the proposal again. Um, I've been doing this talk too much. I kind of jumped to the punchline. It was 70,000 square miles when they proposed it, and you know, 46,000 square miles offshore of California was in the initial proposal. So you know, we asked for more because that's what we do. Um, we asked for all this, really. You know, we wanted the, the migration zone to be covered. You know, we noted that there's a lot of them here. Why didn't you include those? Um, and we really wanted water quality um, to be a principal constituent element. In fact, the proposed rule said, hey, we're considering it. What do you think? You know, it was an open comment period. So we included a bunch of stuff about water quality. Well, what else did we want? We wanted fisheries in there. There's direct take entanglement from derelict gear gill nets that impede the migration and general ecosystem impacts of the habitat caused by fisheries. Fisheries are the number one threat to the leatherback sea turtle. Um, vessel strikes, you know, there's huge vessels interfering with migration pathways. The water quality, um, you can narrow down on the plastic pollution that is known to be lethal to leatherback sea turtles. There was actually a publication in 2009 chronicling that, um, estimating that 37% of leatherback in the Pacific Ocean have plastic inside them. Um, and so there's chemicals that impact the prey and the sea turtles, and the pollution harms the whole habitat, you know, harms the whole ecosystem. And then obviously we wanted this offshore migration areas to connect the habitat. We also asked, talked about in our comment letter that we believe, believe that, you know, global warming and ocean acidification were problems too. So we, we, you know, we submitted a lot. And we're back to here, you know, this is what um, was part of the proposal. And, you know, overall, in this, this uh, common period that we had, we activated our members, our allies, and a lot of different groups, and we had over 58,000 comments sent in. You know, our particular coalition sent in tens of thousands of letters, and, you know, a lot of, all the letters, even the other groups said, look, put the fisheries in there. We kind of knew that they, they weren't going to be in there. Um, they weren't in the proposal. The reason, rationale is that the fisheries are a direct take, and they're, under Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act, there's a whole process that they go through to do an incidental take permit in the fishery management process. So, you know, the opposition was actually from fisheries, from the Navy, from offshore power, tribal concerns, with it, which they remedied by um, changing the border from the high, high tide to the low, low tide. So now it's low, low tide and out, and that means the tribes don't have to worry about, I don't know, gathering jellyfish in the low tide zone. It was just the gathering and the, the gathering principles that they wanted to uphold. So we're out of their gathering zone. Um, economic calculations um, were huge, and there was a 200-page document on the economics of this. And the economics actually were a major driver in the final decision. Um, but that's a whole other talk that I that, you know, don't even want to get into. Um, so we have the critical habitat, and it was actually interesting. You know, um, National Parks put in some comments up in Point Reyes about the crab pots and. Um, the crab pot issue, um, if you're really following marine conservation, you would know that, okay, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, okay, that's kind of self-explanatory, it classifies fisheries. And a category one fishery is the most deadly. It's category two, category three. Recently, in 2011, they reclassified the lobster and crab fishery in Maine and the, and the upper um, northeast as a category one fishery for whales because of the crab pot line, because of the floats entangling the whales. So this is really an issue, you know, and, and I was really surprised, you know, I talked to the National Park people um, over there and I didn't know they submitted that comment. And I found out later by going through the comments that were in the public record. So it was interesting. So, you know, there are some things to look at next steps. So the final rule was this January. It went into effect in February. Um, they eliminated the migratory pathway, insufficient inf information. The prey PCE was further defined to include density. Nothing else was added. And the protected areas were defined, really, and reshaped by prey density estimates. So, you know, it's interesting because I met one of the grad students who did one of the only studies on jellyfish density on California. And, you know, and then here we are. This is like this master student grad student. You know, her research probably 
shaped this more than anything. Um, and it was really focused on the, the prey. The migratory pathway, if you read in, what it said is, is if you remember those slides with the migrating leatherbacks, you know, they wanted a pathway. They wanted to protect a corridor for migration. When they looked at it, they see the leatherbacks don't follow road maps. They're not on a freeway with definitions. They're just headed over. You know, the currents are different every year. Every year, the oceanography is a little different. The warm spot, the cold spot, whatever they're looking for changes. Uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service didn't see a clear corridor, so they didn't protect it. You know, they, that was what their rationale was, is they wanted a pathway. They didn't see a pathway. They saw a random track, so they didn't know how to deal with that. So nothing <coughs> sufficient information. So that's where we are. We have prey density as the final <coughs> you know, critical habitat driver. And so the, the, the positive things is um, they actually moved um, this Oregon one from about here down to Cape Blanco because this is a really productive upwelling zone and there are a lot of leatherbacks seen just off here. So that was really nice and that's what we got. So this is it. So critical habitat, you know, what is, what's the difference? Um, with the fisheries, like I said, they remain under the Endangered Species Act uh, Section 7 management. Um, but right now, you know, there's a new proposal that they're looking into expanding one of these deadly fisheries in there. So, you know, I put up there, check it out on the website for what's new. Um, offshore oil activities, that's the big one in a lot of people's minds. Uh, when you have critical habitat in your offshore oil or any federal EIS document, if you have critical habitat, it's another checkbox. And you know, for years and years with sea turtles, it, there's been no checkboxes for critical habitat. And so now we've got the checkbox, so people looking at offshore um, permitting and, and offshore construction have that checkbox. And what does that mean? It just means additional environmental review. How will this impact leatherback foraging? How will it impact the prey species of the leatherback? So offshore power, not just oil, are also subject to this additional review. The other big one, big one, big one, is um, is this, the desalination and cooling intake pipes are known to bring in jellyfish polyps, small life stages of jellyfish, and they don't come back out. You know, they go in, but they don't come back out as viable jellyfish. So the intake issue with a lot of the proposed desalination plants along California is a real hot one with the lead factor of habitat being finalized. And it's a hot one with a lot of people. The Ocean Protection Council recently published their strategic plan, and they want to uphold the stricter, you know, intake guidelines, stricter than the desal people want. They, they're saying, look, we're, we're different than this other cooling, once through cooling. We're not those guys, we're these guys. So um, it's going to be interesting moving forward. Um, this is a slide that I had put together a while ago. Um, in 2010, we were in the Gulf of Mexico, and the sea turtles were covered in oil. And we were doing our best to increase rescue efforts, and we did a lot of work raising public awareness. And by the couple months later, the rescue teams had tripled. And they were, by the end of the oil spill, um, thanks to a lot to our awareness and, and uh, pestering, there was uh, more sea turtles rescued in one day than in the entire first couple months of the oil spill. They had the three boat teams instead of one. They really went through rapid expansion, training, and so on. And this was really monumental because the BP oil spill was the first time that the recovery efforts went out to the ocean to recover and recuperate the animals. You know, the status quo is wait till they wash in and see what you can do. Um, so we, were, we got them out there. Um, it's a long story. I was actually approved to do it. Then we sued and we got them to shut down the institute burning. But then I was off the team. So, oh well. But I think we saved more sea turtles with that action, stopping the burning, than I probably could have from a boat, you know, with my two hands. But uh, still. Really uh, interesting summer, and we got a big coalition together, focused on offshore oil, focused on the, the increase to rescue, and this is something that we continue to leverage, you know, down the road. This is the example I like to say that, you know, in the environmental impact statements for the offshore oil leases, they estimate that a major oil spill occurring during the 40-year lifetime of the proposed action, right, all the drilling, you know, they can imagine in 40 years in the Gulf of Mexico, would total 66 injured and one dead. dead. Can't really sea turtle. And in the BP oil spill, there was 481 that were um, killed, 609 total sea turtles. Um, we're still looking at that in terms of how much of that was fisheries, because we know that the shrimp fishery went gangbusters right before the oil hit, and they um, probably were responsible for some of those sea turtle deaths. So what's next? Um, we're looking at this uh, swordfish fishery in California. That's a drift gillnet. Um, our law team has filed a FOIA on the process to kind of see what, what else we can learn. Um, the Plastic Pollution Coalition is engaged in the water quality information. And yeah, more science is needed. I mean, that's, isn't that always the story? More science is needed to fill in the gaps, try to figure out where the insufficient information can become sufficient information and we can maybe go back to 
kind of about the critical habitat thing. Yeah. Well, not really, but I have a question okay, about tracking. So if you're tracking nesting turtles, these are females, presumably, right? Do you have any idea what males do? Do they follow Good the Good question. Do they do something to about? The question is, <laughs> the nesting research is females, right? What about the males? That is a good question, and there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot we don't know about sea turtles in general, leatherbacks specifically. The males that we have data on were caught off shore of California by Scott and his team. So they went out there in their boat, and they had airplanes, and the airplanes told them what sea turtles were, and then they went and got them, and they threw a big net on them, and they got them on board. They had a special boat with no transom to get them on, because you can't lift them over the thing. And they were able to get the backpack on a couple males. So some of that data is but generally speaking, a male sea turtle leaves the beach, you know, with no parents around it, and never comes back until it's dead. It's in the ocean its whole life, you know, breeding and feeding. Yeah? The uh, boundary of the new protection area, it since it's in the U.S., the British, I assume it ended at the Mexican border. Oh. In the south. And my question is, is, is there a corollary or a corresponding protection area south? No. There's no other area. This is it. I mean, this the, the area ends here. This is another line. This is our exclusive economic zone. You know, this is what we have jurisdiction over. But yeah, it doesn't even go into Southern California. Oh, okay. So the drift field net fishery is really active off of here. They have no worries. They're outside of it. So it's this area here. And this outer edge is defined by uh, 3,000 meters, not 3,000 feet. And this is a uh, 2,000 meters, so it's, it's a you know bigger shell. Ours drops off quicker, um, and then it goes down to 80 meter depth. So you know that's how deep the most common feeding is. But we'll talk more about the biology of the um, So, but then in Mexico, oh my gosh, Mexico is kind of deadly zone for sea turtles in general. Why? Why is that middle section skipped? The well, the satellite. Oops, I got too far. The satellite tracking data showed that there wasn't a lot of action in that area. And so they said, we don't see a lot of leatherbacks, we're not gonna use that area. You know, they had the economic analysis really driving a choice of only the most important stuff because they were afraid, which was critical habitat, it would exclude some things and make some people nervous, there was more rules. So they didn't want get to get, give us everything. Um, they tried to you know, rationalize uh, minimization and efficiency to the designation of critical habitat, and there just wasn't a lot of tracking data to support it. Now, you know, let's keep tracking them, keep looking at them, maybe in 10 years, which, you know, I don't even think we have 10 years data, really. You know, another 10 years, that our data will double, and we'll see what we see. Um, but right now, that's the ruling. Yeah. So, let's talk about the leatherback. It's the largest species of sea turtle in the world. Um, it grows to over eight feet and over 2,000 pounds. Um, it's the deepest diving sea turtle. It's known to dive um, up to 1,800 feet deep to search for food. We don't know what. I mean, we usually see jellyfish at the surface, but they're going down there and they're foraging <coughs> zones. They don't do these deep dives on their migratory transits. It's when they get to the foraging areas, like we saw earlier, the squares, the different ecosystem zones, is when they do the deep diving. Um, the, the migration, when it first sets out from the beach, they've been tracked to go over 30 miles a day. Um, it's the largest global range of any reptile on Earth, you know, travel, going through all the oceans and the equatorial regions and up into the cold regions. Um, it's survived the extinction of the dinosaurs over 100 million years ago, basically unchanged. Um, if you see one of these creatures, you're looking at a living dinosaur, um, a lot like a great white shark or crocodile or a sturgeon. Um, the Pacific populations are much, much less than the Atlantic populations of leatherback sea turtles. Um, and then the West Pacific population is greater than the East Pacific population. So let's think about that. So where are we? Are we in the West Pacific in California or East Pacific? East. east. Yeah, we're in the East Pacific. And the East Pacific sea turtles nest in um, Mexico, a lot of them in Costa Rica, and you know, in those Central American countries. And the, that one population of sea turtles is in the most trouble. And the western population of sea turtles that actually come off California are all born and nest in the Indonesian uh, Papua Barat area up in Papua New Guinea. Pretty interesting. And this is the only sea turtle that's adapted to cold. You know, reptiles are cold blooded. Reptiles, when they get cold, they slow down. Their metabolism slows down, everything slows down. And, and generally, if a sea turtle is on shore in California, it's cold and it's sick 
and the ability to elevate the body temperature through metabolic activity really helps, and it's the most efficient swimmer of all sea turtles. It's three times more hydrodynamically efficient, it's believed that the, the ridges and the little bumps on the ridges really help. You know, they, they channel the sea turtles to be on a straighter path with, with each, each thrust, and the, um, I don't know if you ever look like vortices, you know, the, the vortices that break up the laminar flow can be caused by those little bumps, you know, to make it more efficient, as it swims through the water. It's pretty amazing. It's also basically eating jellyfish, and it selects the higher calorie jellyfish, the brown sea nettle versus the moon jelly. And so it's got this basic life history of, you know, in the ocean, eating jellyfish. And we know jellyfish have been around since the dinosaurs and beyond. Jellyfish may be the first, you know, living thing in the planet. So, you know, it's figured out a good way to stay alive. Just, you just need jellyfish and just need an ocean. And a beach, but some of that's running out. So industrial fishing is the biggest problem for these sea turtles. Um, the issue is by catch. You know that is uh, some people like to say by kill. Uh, that's when somebody's caught that they didn't mean to catch. And in many cases, like leatherback is an endangered species, you can't just take it home with you. You got to throw it back. Um, how the survivorship is after it's been caught, brought on board, and thrown back, we really don't know. You know, a lot of the observer observer sheets will say it was released alive. And and but does that mean it's live another year, we're not sure. Um, so they're critically endangered, they're vulnerable to all this stuff we already talked about. Vessel strikes, predation by sharks is one of them that we didn't talk about. And then um, down here is some more stuff. Illegal poaching, nesting beach destruction, light pollution, fossil fuel frenzy, global warming are all threats to global sea turtle populations. But those are threats that we're not necessarily experiencing in our backyard. You know, I like to try to focus, you know, in California on what we can do as Californians, which, you know, are some of these issues here. Um, the vessel strikes and the coastal pollution and the fishery. And those are the issues we work a lot on. And, you know, we've got this t-shirt and it used to be one of our main things is, you know, is how long is the leatherback? <coughs> you know, I was talking to Scott earlier, he brought up this uh, 1994 edition of National Geographic with the sea turtles. It's a brilliant article in here. And, uh, you know, they really question the ability of the sea turtles to survive in 20 years in the Pacific Ocean. And this is a great little illustration of like a dinosaur So this is, um, I really want to get an update on this, I'm sorry I don't have it, but I know for a fact that, that the Costa Rica Playa Grande nesting is still down to about 40 or 50 individuals, and sometimes these individuals <coughs> nest four or five times, so you might see that there's like two or three hundred nests, but that's really only 40 or 50 um, individual leatherback sea turtles coming back to the main nesting beach, Playa Grande, in Costa Rica, so that's in the North Pacific. And this is the extinction risk analysis right here. Extinction risk analysis. So 1.0, that's 100% probability extinction. And with the error bars, I mean, they're really reaching that within 20 years. And that's this is some of the foundation of the stuff that National Geographic talked about in the article. Is the study um, that they don't have a lot of time left at the current rate that they're being captured, killed, etc. But honestly, things have changed a lot um, since the, the early 1990s, the, the early 2000s. Had some really real progress with management industrial fishing. These are the two big culprits: long line and gill net. Um, long line is just that; it's long, and the gill net is a big net. You know, big hole, not little hole, big hole. And this is a diagram showing the legal drift gill net off California. In fact, this is an old slide that I borrowed from an old presentation. It's no longer valid because Oregon has banned them. So Oregon's banned the drift gill net. Drift gill nets are banned by the United Nations on the high seas, but they're still allowed offshore California. And that's something we're focusing more and more on, is why and how come, and how can we stop that? Because they're spending a lot of time in the Fisheries Management Council debating this, and they're not ready to give up the conservation area that we've already established. They realize that that's a valid decision. And just the management time being spent talking about this difficult fishery is enough to, in our mind, to make it go away. You know, let's, let's move on. Stop trying to fix something that's so obviously broken. Uh, so this is global pelagic longline fishing effort. Again, an old slide, but uh, it really tells a picture of the density. So if you have this color down here, you're at 26 to 47 or 42 million hooks per area. You know, this is like 12 to 26 million hooks. Um, there's estimated to be a billion to two billion longline hooks in the ocean at any given time. And so, yeah, if you're in the Mediterranean and you're a sea turtle, you know. 
hang on. You know, that's going to be a rough ride. You know, this is an area over here where the leatherbacks go, right in here, the eastern equatorial Pacific. And, you know, this is an area where, obviously, there's a lot of nesting. So this is, this is don't go over here if you're a sea turtle. Um, so the leatherbacks, you know, really are threatened by longline. And it's not so much because they eat the bait. It's just the fact that the longline catches them on the shoulder and pulls them down is all it takes. The leatherback needs to breathe, and that's a problem. I mean, if, if it gets caught on a short leader and it can breathe, there's a good chance it'll get to the boat and they'll cut the line and they'll just have a line off of it for a while um, until it comes to nesting beach and someone takes it off. Um, and that's fine. I'm not fine, but that's that uh, that sea turtle will live. You know, it's the ones that are caught down on the deep lines and they can't make it back to the air. And, and if they don't get them in a couple hours, and a lot of times these long lines are set out overnight or for a couple days. Um, so who knows how long the average long line is? Thank you guys. 200 feet, longer, a thousand feet, is a long line, longer. So what do, you, what do we think? A thousand feet, 10 miles, or 100 miles? It's more like 10 to 50 miles is the average long line. Yeah, 10 to 50 miles long, and uh, you know the ones in Korea and Japan are definitely in the 30 to 40 mile long. Um, the average long line, like the, the Florida swordfish long line fishery that just got certified by the Marine Stewardship Council as eco-friendly, even though it kills sea turtles. Um, that average is 12 and a half miles long, long line. That's why they call them long. So the, the plastic issue is not just eating it, but it's also entanglement. And this looks a lot like the crab pots. Um, I do a lot of beach cleanups and stuff, and that, that's the thing that, that um, my friend calls blue steel. This rope you see all the time. It's just so strong. This rope is amazingly strong. And so we're talking now about the plastic pollution issue. You know, here's our ocean. There's a couple gyres that trap stuff that's floating. A lot of it is litter nowadays. So the litter, it's degrading and sinking eventually, but for many years it's floating in this kind of soup issue. And this is what is in the Chronicle, estimated to be like 300 feet below, you know, within the diving range of a lot of the animals, within the feeding range of a lot of the, la the layers that come up to feed at night. Um, a lot of the deep water fish come up to feed at night. And you know, is it a patch? Is it the soup? Either way, it's a plastic buffet for the sea turtles. And this is a picture of the inside. Really interesting biology here. Form equals function. Is This is the throat, the esophagus of the leatherback. It has these spikes. It's a one-way street. You know, if you're a jellyfish, you go in, you don't come out. Right? And they, they can't, sea turtles physically cannot regurgitate their food. It's, it's a one-way street. That's how they've evolved. And um, in talking to people, more and more people that do the work on the, and this is all out of one sea turtle, this, this pile. You know, talking with the people that do this kind of research, uh, a really resonating statement is, you know, that um, everything on this planet is edible except plastic for, or for animals. And, and if you think about it, it's kind of true. You know, there's, there's organisms that eat dirt and get stuff out of it, like worms. You know, they, they filter feed the ocean. You know, they chew on trees, like, you know, fungus and mushroom can actually digest the cellulose. But, you know, no one right now knows of an organism that can actually eat plastic. Um, it's something that we created and put in the ecosystem. So I've got a, a research permit uh, with Ben Becker up at Point Reyes National Seashore, and I've been just doing density surveys of plastic pollution on the ocean. It's actually marine debris. Um, and people that are the advocates tell me, say plastic pollution. And, you know, as scientists, I say marine debris because it's not just plastic. I'm, I'm tallying. Um, and I'm coordinating with a lot of people um, to figure out, you know, when they're doing their beach cleanups. I try to get my data at times that they're not. Um, but like with Surfrider, I'm going to be doing one before and after the cleanup to kind of add some validation um, as of this method and the cleanup. And I'm looking at the density, the distribution, and then I'm, I'm trying to get more done on this recruitment issue. But I'm realizing that Ben doesn't want to, like, let me just camp out on the beach and shut an area down to people. So we're getting there. Uh, but that's what it's going to take. It's going to take you know an area that no one disturbs, and then we'll see how much comes in every day. Um, so I'm working on that. And the density is the big thing. So you know I'm, I'm doing a study area of known size. I'm measuring it every time on a transect. And if you look around, a lot of people are talking about plastic pollution anecdotally. You know, look at this giant bag. You know, it weighs 30 pounds. People, this is a lot of trash, right? Well, is it that one tire that weighs 30 pounds? And, you know, so it's really hard to get to the bottom of it. So one way to do it is density, you know, items per area. And that's where I'm at now. I mean, going to the next level.
level would be like, let's measure every item, but whew, that's going to take forever. So I'm not doing it that way. So I'm working on it. I was down in Costa Rica, saw a love back. Amazing. Here's love back A, the largest sea turtle egg. And the beach patrols, we, we try to wear black. Um, this, this particular couple was on board. Um, they had paid a fee to kind of go along for the night, and that's how they can make some money to keep the project going, actually. And then this is the newest news. So our organization has just begun an effort. We have a bill sponsored in Sacramento to name the Leatherback as the official state symbol, one of the official state symbols, um, make it the official marine reptile of the state of California. And just like there's the poppy and the Giribaldi, you know, we want to say Leatherback so that when kids are in the classroom, they learn about the Leatherback as one of the most important things for California in terms of the, the animals and, and the different symbols that we look towards. So we're excited to move that forward. We're going to need your help. You know, I did a seminar recently where I passed out paper, letterheads, and we all wrote to them. You know, I'm running out of time right now, but I'll have a couple things up here. So, you know, now that you've learned a little bit about us, I'll just send these around and we can pass these around. We'll start with this one. This one's just kind of the event sign-in form, and it has some check boxes and it has an area for notes. If you're into, like, I want to volunteer on the weekends, you know, you can write that on the notes or, you know, contact me about this. You know, I'm trying to speak to as many people as I can, clubs, you know, groups. And this is right here is the help pass the Leatherback Bill. You know, the Leatherback Bill is AB 1776, so we got a pretty cool number. And the sponsor is Fong, who we sponsor the Sharkman Band. So, you know, I approached him at his little victory party for Sharkmans, and he was really psyched on continuing ocean conservation and loved this idea, and he's our main sponsor. So this is really for California residents. I think that's just about everybody here. And uh, no pressure, just want to share that. I also got uh, some, five, some uh, newsletters up here. I'll just leave these. And, you know, this is the new website we have, AB1776, and that's me. Um, i got another slide with, with my contact info coming up. And this is what I really want to see you guys at next is our big event, May 11th. We're going to do a seminar day, the Blue Mind Seminar Series. Um, Jay Nichols is a friend. He's on our board of directors. He's a sea turtle researcher. He's, he's, he's the guy in 1996 with a satellite on the back of the, of the loggerhead, swam across the Pacific Ocean. It was the first time anyone had really publicized the fact that the sea turtle swims across the entire ocean. And the Pacific being the biggest, it was a big deal. So we're going to be at the Romberg Tiburon Center. We're partnering with San Francisco State to do a day of uh, seminars on sharks, on leatherback, on plastic pollution, on eelgrass and ecosystems in the bay. And it's going to be free for students, other folks. We'll ask for, you know, we'll see what you can contribute. It's, it's no big deal. And then we're going to do in the evening the Blue Mind, you know, and this is right here. It says, it says, you know, we're turning this idea into a movement. That's, that's Jay with his Blue Mind connecting um, all these conservation issues with neuroscience. Because really, um, we'll, as, if, as you'll learn if you go, the neuroscience is the focus of a lot of corporations, industry, and marketing professionals right now. It's like, how do we think and how do we make our decisions? And, you know, we'll learn about that. And it's pretty fascinating. Um, and how, you know, the ocean is actually one of the stronger connections we have with the waves and all the waves of the universe and in our heart and in our mind. Um, and so the other thing I just wanted to throw out there is this Plastics 360 event is this weekend in Marin. Um, it's sponsored by Green Sangha and ourselves, and we've got a great team together to talk about plastic pollution in ourselves and our society and in the ocean. Um, if you've ever gotten it all into this issue, the book I recommend is called Plastic, A Toxic Love Story, and it's yellow, it's a big yellow book. And the author of that book is going to be at our event. Um, she lives here in the Bay Area. So that's going to be a lot of fun. I hope you guys can keep in touch. And that's my last slide, I think. And thanks for your time. You know, thanks for uh, anything you can sign up for. And let me know if you have any questions.
individuals are becoming more and more of an important consistent, okay, you know, your love for the seat curl doesn't fade with that budget cycle. You know, like other foundations do their 401k paint, and now they don't want to give as much because they got to rein it in. Um, we do have some funding from agencies, you know, especially for the bond project, um, not so much for the seat turtle project. And then again, you know, so it's really diverse. You know, the project's working together under one roof sometimes. If one comes up short, which is usually spawn, um, we can add. And the sea turtles, you know, being 20 years of history, we've got a lot of key people, you know, across the nation that are now all over the world that really know we're one of the, you know, most acutely focused on the policy stuff. You know, a lot of the sea turtle projects, you know, they're partnering with agencies on the beach with those permits, doing the, the hands-on stuff. And we need that. But those people aren't in a position to go argue with the funders say, you know, I know you're a National Marine Fishery Service and you're managing my beach, but you're also managing the fishery that's killing them. So that limits their ability